Okay, Grant, one question now on the Ark of the Covenant. Is it essential that the Ark of the Covenant is found yes. to rest in the, in the temple? It is indeed. And okay. I know where you think it is. Well, with yeah, well that's really the second part of the question. Inside information. <laughs> where yes. do you think this Ark is? Is it the same Ark, obviously? Yes. I believe the Ark still exists. I believe it's indestructible. I do not believe it could be lost permanently. I believe that ark, which contained the Shekinah glory of God dwelling on the mercy seat between the, uh, the cherubim, was taken down to Ethiopia 3,000 years ago during the reign of Solomon. He started out well, but by marrying pagan wives in the hundreds, he even allowed them to bring pagan idols right into the temple. He became an apostate toward the end of his life. We know that he had relations with the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of Ethiopia, who traveled 2,000 miles to see him, the wisest man who ever lived. The Bible tells us that he had no aversion to women. He loved women. He married everyone he could, including Pharaoh's daughter. The Bible says that when she left, Solomon gave her many gifts, plus the desire of her heart. Now, what would the desire of the heart be of a a woman, the queen of Ethiopia, if it would not be to have a royal son fathered by the man who she came 2,000 miles to visit, right. the greatest king the world had ever seen. The Ethiopian records, the Cabra Nagas, the Royal Chronicles, tells us that they married and had a son. He would be an equal descendant with the rest of the sons of David and Solomon. And the royal family of Ethiopia still lives. They're in England now, in exile, but they still live. What the Ethiopians say is that their son grew to become a righteous Jew. And at age 19, seeing the apostasy of his father, and now his mother died, he had to return to Ethiopia 2,000 miles to the south, and he knew he'd never come back. His father, apparently, according to the Royal Chronicles of Ethiopia, made a replica of the Ark, a perfect replica, same materials. You couldn't tell them apart intending that he would take the replica. But apparently the story is that the young prince, Menelik, born to Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, recognizing the apostasy of the father with the cooperation of the high priest, switched arcs, took the real one to Ethiopia with the approval of Solomon, not knowing the switch. Solomon was left in his apostasy with the fake, the replica. They intended not to steal it, but to hold it for safekeeping until Israel came to its senses spiritually, which it never did. Hmm. It's a downhill Correct. history. Now, after 3,000 years, in 1989, the end of the Ethiopian Civil War, as 10,000 and thousands more of Ethiopian black Jews called the Falasha or the exiles of Israel, they returned to Israel. And at that time, I have three independent sources. A Christian Canadian diplomat who was Canada's ambassador to NATO. He was an advisor to Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia. He traveled at the end of the Civil War to Ethiopia at the age of 76 in poor health to save the royal family that were under house arrest. And as we know from history, royals get killed at the end of civil wars yep. so that they can't restore the monarchy. He saved them. When he came back to Vancouver, I met him. And he told me a story. And this has been confirmed by an Israeli Air Force general and an Ethiopian Air Force general. That Israel made an arrangement with the outgoing communist leaders. Not only did they pay millions in bribes to let the Jews go, but they paid a $42 million bribe to let the Ark go. In cooperation with the righteous Christian priest in northern Ethiopia, Aksum, where the Ark had been in safekeeping for 3,000 years at the Church of Mary underground hmm. in a temple. They flew in with a group of Israeli commandos, all of them Levites, so that they would follow the prescription of the Bible, carrying it on the staves on their shoulders, onto a plane that flew back to Israel where it is now held in safekeeping, secretly. Several rabbis who are well connected with the Sanhedrin have confirmed to me that it is there in Israel, waiting for the sign from God to build the temple. Now, let me give you something that Jeremiah says. Jeremiah, writing 25 centuries ago, says in chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, 
He says in verse 16, it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days. He's talking about the millennium. When the Messiah reigns, he says, he talks about that God's going to cover the earth with knowledge and understanding. And he says, in that time, the Jews shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall the ark come to mind. Neither shall they remember the ark. Neither shall they visit the ark. Neither shall that be done any more. Now think about it. For 2,500 years, the Jews haven't talked about the ark, haven't visited the ark. Haven't thought it about hasn't the been the center of their worship, right? Why would Jeremiah say that when the Messiah comes and the millennium begins, the kingdom of God, that Israel will stop talking about the ark and visiting the ark and doing that thing with the ark unless just before the Messiah came, it the was ark was restored, okay. was in the temple. Because remember, the tabernacle and the temple had one purpose, to house the ark. And remember that the Antichrist, when he rises from the dead after he's assassinated, halfway through that seven-year tribulation, he is satanically resurrected from an assassination wound to his neck and head. When he does so, he goes into the rebuilt temple, into the house of God, and he defiles it. And the Bible says he does his strange act. What if the Ark of the Covenant with the Shekinah glory is in the rebuilt temple and he somehow touches it, sits on the mercy seat? Something. But, but that would explain why God says, Jesus, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, flee to the hills. He says, the wrath of God's going to be poured out. Don't even go in and get your clothes. Go to the hills because God is going to release his wrath hmm. when that happens. But Grant, a lot of people also say that because Jesus came and died and, you know, when we receive him as Savior and he cleansed our sins, that the ark doesn't hold that status anymore with the presence of God because the presence of God lives in us. Well, the fact of the matter is the Bible says the ark will be important during that period the temple is built, yeah, during that tribulation, and then is no longer important. Why? Because Jesus, the Messiah, will rule from the throne of David right. in Jerusalem. Right. The ark points to Jesus, the presence of God, the Shekinah glory. Jesus will be there in person, and the ark won't be important but as of, anymore. But as of today, and, and, and folks, just to be clear here, as of today, many of is people in Israel, the, the Hebrews, the Jews, don't recognize Jesus, therefore no. don't recognize what he's done, and therefore will still see the ark in its Old Testament position. Absolutely. Where let we don't today. Let me tell you, back in 89, when I was writing Armageddon, 18% of the Jews in Israel believed they should build the temple. The latest figure, last year, says 58% of the Jews in Israel. Far more than just the religious. Even secular Jews say the temple must be built because it will be a statement to ourselves and to the Arabs and the world. Yes. When We're we here forever. <laughs> when we come back, we're talking to Grand Jeffrey. We just kind of take a Apocalypse in the End Times, welcome back. Grant, just to remind us, because we've now spent nearly two programs on the rebuilding of the temple, why is it so important? It's important as a sign to Israel that the Messiah is coming, because they believe that the temple must be built again, and they believe that Elijah, the prophet, will come, as Malachi taught at the last book of the Old Testament, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. He also refers to Moses. These are the two witnesses spoken of in Re the book of Revelation that they will come. And what is important is when the church is taken home to glory at the rapture, at the resurrection, God will not leave the world without a witness. That's why he sends the two witnesses to witness to Israel and the nations. And he also sends the 144,000 Jews, and he protects them supernaturally by sealing them. Otherwise, the Antichrist would kill them in a day. But he can't kill them. For that period that they're protected, they're going to tell people that the sacrifice points to Jesus. They're going to tell them that the temple tells them that Jesus, the Messiah, is coming. And there will be hundreds and hundreds of millions saved of every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue, not only Jews, according to Revelation 7. And so the greatest evangelism that we've probably ever seen is going to take place during terrible persecution and martyrdom in that time, and the temple's a big part of it.